let's get into the message. So today's message uh, I've entitled The Power of Touch and it is um, difficult to connect and I can't shake your hand. I can't, uh, you know, touch your shoulder or I can't, uh, you know, you can't give anybody a hug right now. And I, I just, I, I don't like it. Um, but Nina said something very powerful in the prayer time. And she said that it was her prayer that the tangible presence of God would be felt in your living rooms. And so that is what I'm believing for right now. And that's what I'm contending for in your living room right now. That you feel the presence of God the same as if you would feel the presence of God when we're together in corporate worship. I, you need to have faith that God can show up in your living room. Uh, you need to have faith that the Holy Spirit can move in your midst right now, just as He moves when we when we get together on Sunday mornings. And so I want to encourage you right now just to invite the Holy Spirit in to your living room. In fact, let's just do it right now in prayer. Would you just bow your heads and, and close your eyes as we as we pray? Heavenly Father, I thank you. It's your character and it's your loving kindness is steady, is consistent, and is very clear. And I thank you for the stability that you bring into our lives. Jesus, I, Jesus, you're so fascinating to us. May we never lose our curiosity, our wonder, our amazement of, of who you are, Jesus, and, and what you've done and how you loved us. Oh man, Jesus, you're just, Jesus, you're the best. And you gave us the Holy Spirit. And Holy Spirit, I pray right now that you just come into our into our being, into our hearts. But I, I, I pray that Holy Spirit, you will you will be very real right now in our homes. Very tangible. And I pray that, that we can even just smell your presence like a like a sweet perfume that comes into our houses. I pray for all those that are dealing with stress and anxiety and fear, that you would just soothe their, their fears right now. And the, the peace of God will transcend their situation, guard their hearts and their minds in Christ. So Holy Spirit, move. And God, I also pray that the healing presence of the Holy Spirit will also be in our homes. And I, I ask for divine healing for those that need it. For those that are fighting the common cold, God, I pray you heal them. For those that are dealing with heart conditions and diabetes, God, I pray that you just come in right now and the Holy Spirit just cleanse their blood physically and heal them. God, I believe that you can heal through the airwaves just as much as you can heal by a physical touch. So Holy Spirit, be in our midst and be in our homes, be in our minds, and be in our hearts. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I hope that, that you feel God's presence right now. I think He is here in your in your room. And, uh, and, and I hope He's real. Now, um, I want to, like if you're on the couch, I want you to scoot on into each other and, and Maybe you just reach out and touch your spouse or your kids. And that is important to do. Because there's something very special and something very valuable about the tangible touch. And again, we can't touch right now. And if you're watching by yourself, God bless you. Uh, if I was there, I'd give you a hug. But I want to I want to encourage you just to be in close proximity and, and just to touch one another. And if you, you know, your, your kids are probably in the bedroom right now either, you know, watching YouTube or something. Uh, when this is over, when the sermon's over, I want you to, 
I want you to give your kids a hug and an embrace because they need it in this season. Uh, one of the moments in my life that really marked me and uh, is one of the it, it, it's one of the defining moments that uh, that drives me to do what I do, not just in the area of ministry, but in the area of, of social justice and, and ministry to the poor, is that uh, after I graduated from high school, I did a short-term missions trip um, to Romania, and this was in 1990. And so this was also the year um, that the Ber Berlin Wall came down, and in Romania, there was a horrible revolution, and uh, Ceausescu was the dictator that uh, was deposed. But what he did to his people was, was horrific uh, on a huge level. And so we came in, and a lot of Christians came in to help and to minister to the needy and the broken and the poor. And so we did a lot of work in the orphanages. And uh, uh, the orphanage that we were in was... It was, it was an incredible orphanage where um, the workers there really loved the kids and they were really doing the best with what they had. And uh, they had taken kids from other institutions and they were trying to put them back together. Because what was going on inside of these orphanages is that um, there was, I don't even know why this happens, but um, there, was no, there was no physical touch. And the kids, when we got there, basically uh, it was our job to play and engage and interact and interface and to physically hug children. And that's basically all that they needed. And they, they, we, we told them about the gospel, we did the VBS, we did the whole works. But what they really wanted was, was just a human touch because they hadn't had it. Um, there, I, one of the, the, and I still have this kid's picture. He's, I have his face in my memory. It's never going to go away. It's a little Slavic boy and a little rounded, you know, probably peasant stock like myself, a little uh, Slavic kid, and he would not let go of me. And just that, just that, that, you know, he would hold on to my pant leg and he would hold on to me. And he would not let go. And it's like that was so heartbreaking just to, to see somebody that was so hungry for attention because he didn't have it. He didn't have withdrawals. And the other moment that, that haunted me, a memory that, that stayed with me forever, was that, um, it, and again, I, I believe that this orphanage was, was really helping kids, and they got kids that were in really bad shape. And I just remember going by a, a barn of some sort, and they had a child in a cage. And the, the, the child had never had any physical touch in her, in her entire life. And what that did to the soul of that individual, it fractured her soul. She, she was a, a very broken person. And it was just complete horror. And so I guess you could say that we were there to put these kids back together that had never been touched. And so this is what isolation does. Isolation on that level will, will strip us from our humanity and it will literally fracture our souls. Now, we might... A lot of us are experiencing some isolation. It's nothing to that extreme, but I want you, I want to make you aware and mindful of what isolation at a huge level can do. It can it can fracture fracture your soul. It could it could pull you away from from the, the most important things in life. And this crisis that we find ourselves in, the crisis is going to it's going to challenge you to your very core. It's going to challenge your faith. It's going to challenge your hope. It's even going to challenge your love. First Corinthians 13. So these are the three main categories, faith, hope, and love. Of course, the greatest of love. 
And so, uh, I know from my own personal experience, this kind of walking through what we're going through and experiencing what we're going through, my, my faith has is, is been challenged. And maybe you've, maybe you've had the same experience where your faith is like, oh, I, this, this is kind of rocking to the, to the core of my faith. And I know that chances are your hope has been challenged in this season. And so this is the things that we're going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about what this isolation, what this crisis can do, and the impact that it has to our faith and to our hope. So take a moment and think about that. Like, what has it done? How, is it, how has it affected you? Are you... Are, are, is your faith shaken? Is is your hope weak? And so let's just let's just think about it and let's just let's just lean into it. Uh, what is what is faith? Uh, faith that are, is the things that uh, the un, unseen things that, that that we hope for. It is faith is it's a very deep spiritual connection to God's vision. Faith is, is directly in line with optics. And so as we, in this season that we find ourselves in, your faith will either grow and get stronger, or it's going to falter and you're going to see how strong your faith really was. Basically the question is, before this crisis, uh, did you have a strong, deep faith or did you have a shallow faith? So let me explain to you what a, what a shallow faith, in my opinion, would be. So shallow faith is a, it's a, it's a drive, it's an impulse that is somewhat based in um, wishful thinking and wanting the best out of the situation. Now those things aren't necessarily bad, but let me give you an example. So when I was a boy, um, I, I, I wanted... <laughs> I was probably around 13, 12 or 13. So, completely fascinated with who Jesus was. And completely uh, dedicated to, okay, how do I become a better Christian? And how do I increase my faith muscle? And so I had this bright idea that uh, I'm going to, because the Bible says that we need to do everything that Jesus does. And so my, the bright idea was is that I was going to try to walk on water. And I practice. I practice on my swimming pool. And so... And so this is how I did it. It's like, I was like, okay, I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it. You know the, little, the story about the little, the little train that could? I forgot the name of that train. Maybe it's the little train that could. But I think I can, I think I can, I think I can, I know I can, I know I can. And so I began just to work myself up that I can walk on water. And I have faith to do it. And, of course, every time I try it, I just fall right back into the water. And uh, why? It's, it's just, it's, you know, you're just... I'm trying to prove something. I'm trying to challenge God. It's coming from a place that is not actually good. It's actually coming from a place that doesn't have anything to do with real, lasting, strong faith. It was uh, a desperate push and a wishful thinking. And that's a shallow faith. See, Jesus never really, he didn't act and he didn't pray in that way. And so when you think about, right now I'm asking you to, to go into a season of prayer, deep prayer and deep fasting. So when you are praying, uh, think about your actual prayer life and the things that are coming out of your mouth and the things that are coming out of your heart when you pray. Are they desperate prayers? I'm not saying God doesn't answer desperate prayers. I just, that's fine. He, he does answer desperate prayers. The Word of God says, in your time of need, call out to God and He'll answer your prayers. So God will answer desperate prayers. But desperate prayers are different than faith-filled prayers. So when we pray, is this, there's this, you know, yeah, we're all a little bit desperate right now. But is there also this wishful thinking that comes along his side? And I'm not saying God can't come in and, and answer those prayers. He does. He comes in and He does rescue. But just because He's come in and He's answered your prayer and He's rescued you from a bad situation, that doesn't mean that you are going to increase your faith level. And you know this to be true. A lot of us are walking, or we, we've, we've asked God to save us and to break through, and He does. Maybe He's even healed you physically, 
Maybe he's giving you a financial relief, financial breakthrough. And like before, you were really intense asking and praying for God to come in and help and save you. And as soon as the relief came, it's as if there was no transformation. And you just, you just fell right back into your old pattern and your old way of life. Speaking from experience on this one. So what I'm, what I'm talking about in increasing our faith, is that we need to have faith that runs a little bit deeper than trying to challenge God and walk on water. I'm talking about a faith that is a lifestyle, that is consistent, that is every day. And so, in this very difficult season, the take home that, that, that you need to get, basically there's just two points, faith and hope. On faith, faith is a vision that you have. And I want to encourage you to get a fresh and clear vision that is beyond this crisis. The wisest man on the planet, Solomon said, this too shall pass. So you need to be able to think about this crisis from a higher perspective, from a different optic, saying that, yeah, this is going to end someday. It, and it will. My brothers and sisters, I don't know when. I'm really, like, I don't know when this thing is going to end. But I do know that it will end. And so that is where my, that's where my sight is set. And so for you, and this is what I see, uh, like, again, I don't know what's going to happen. I'm very uncertain about a lot of things in this season. I, I'm uncertain how long it's going to last. I'm uncertain if we're, how we're even going to do church next week. But here's the thing that I am very clear about. This is what I know to be true in the very depths of my soul. What I know is that the vision that God has given us does not change. That vision of transformation. And so I want you to see the vision of transformation for yourself and for your family and for your culture that you find yourself in. So the vision that you have, uh, I, again, I want you to see into the distant future of what you look like and what your family looks like and what Granite Creek looks like. Probably the best thing that I can do, the best little bit of hope I can give you in this very difficult season that you worry you might be feeling isolated. So if you are feeling bored, isolated, you know, not a part of anything, well, you're part of this right now, praise God. But I want to encourage you to, to think into the future, have a faith and a vision into the future that someday we will meet in Granite Creek corporately together and we're going to take communion. That's going to help this, this fracture of your soul that has happened in this isolated state. Now, we need, to, we need to embrace the isolation so we don't peek on this, this virus thing. So I'm, I'm all on board of isolation, but you just, need to make, you just need to be aware of what it will do. Okay? So faith is a vision that we have for our future. Faith is God's vision for your life that's coming down the line. Faith is what, uh, is what we need to do the works of Jesus. Now this week I was, I was reading through the Gospels, and if Jesus and what he said and what he does completely captivated me. So I'm just going to read to you some of the points where Jesus chose to connect over isolation. Matthew 8 uh, verses 2 through 3. And behold, a leper came to him and knelt before him, saying, Lord, if you will, if you are able, can you make me clean? And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him and said, I will be clean. And immediately his leprosy left him. Luke chapter 4, verse 40. Now when the sun was setting, and all those who were sick with various diseases brought them to him, he laid his hands on every one of them, and he healed them. He healed them all. Matthew 9, 29-30 And then he touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith it will be done. And their eyes were opened, and Jesus sternly warned them, don't be mouthing off about this. I want to highlight this point right in the middle. According to their faith, it will be done. 
So that's a very scary, big, giant can of theological worms right there. According to your faith, it will be done. I always, argue, I always wrestle and go back and forth between God's sovereignty and the level of my faith. According to my faith, certain things will be done. So my faith is on trial, and, and your faith is on trial. Don't go after a faith that is trying to work up something emotionally. Go after a faith that's a lifestyle that is, that is deeper in the mysteries of Jesus than it is in wishful thinking and trying to, to force something that you want to happen. That's probably the best way that I can explain it. Is it faith is a deep dive into the mysteries of the Spirit and the mysteries of who God is. So it's according to our faith. So in order for us to grow in faith, putting our whole trust in Him, that, that's some tricky stuff. Now this is a this is an amazing little bit here too. Matthew 14, 35 uh, through 36. And when the men of that place recognized him, they sent around to all the region and brought to him all who were sick and implored him that they might only touch the fringe of his garment. As many touched it, they were made well. And of course, this also um, shadows or, or it is a connection to the woman with the issue of blood where there was crowds of people and all she wanted to do was just to touch his, his clothes. She just needed to reach out and touch his clothes. It was, a, it was a physical act of connection. It was an act of faith that, that touched, that brought the healing. And so it goes both ways. So the, the hand of God, the finger of God, he wants to, God wants to come and he wants to he wants to touch us tangibly, even with His Spirit. He wants to use other people to, to touch and connect others. But there also is an according to our faith, where we have to reach out and touch. Now let me get, clarify. You don't need to be going out and praying for people with COVID right now. I, I just don't think that that's a wise move. But when this is over, I want to encourage you to begin to step out and reach out in faith and pray the prayer of faith that heals the sick. And this is, this is the heart of who Jesus is. I mean, He is willing, He is able, and it's according to our faith. So I, I, I really do believe if we work our faith, if we develop it, if we grow it into the mysteries of who Jesus is, we, we will pray for the sick, and they will get healed. We will pray for people that have disease, and it will be, they'll have to leave their body. We might even be able to walk on water if we get to a maturity level that is doing it out of, a, out of an act of obedience, not out of, a, out of a young boy's desire for a show. So I hope that, that kind of makes sense. Hope. If faith is for the vision of your future, hope is extremely important for your emotional, physical state. Hope is uh, Hebrews 16, uh, 18. We have fled to take hold of the hope set before us, to be greatly encouraged. So I want to encourage you to take, take hold of hope. And we have this hope as an anchor for our soul, it's, it's firm and it's secure, and it enters into the sanctuary behind the curtain, the forerunner of Jesus. He has entered on our behalf. He has become the high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. And what, what he's saying is, is the hope of glory, hope in, hope in what Jesus can do for your soul, your emotional state. So if Faith is for our visions, for optics. 
hope is for your feelings. And so I want to encourage you right now just to check your feelings. If there is a constant state of fear, constant state of dread, I'm not saying that we need to be cautious. We need to make sure that we're not doing dumb things. But we can't continue to live in this constant state of fear and worry and anxiety. I know you're feeling it right now. I feel it myself. I see it on my kid. And I have to fight it with everything inside of me. But there we have this hope in Jesus Christ. The hope of glory. And it gives us control over our emotional state. It's very vital that we do this in this season. 1 Corinthians 13, again, the love verse. If I speak in the tongue of angels and the tongue of men, I don't have love. Maybe you've heard this uh, scripture at a wedding. If I don't have love, I'm a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all the mysteries and all the knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but I do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor, and I give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but I do not have love, I gain absolutely nothing. Love is patient, love is kind, does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, does not dishonor others, it's not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with truth. It protects, it always trusts, it always hopes, always hopes, and it always perseveres. These things that they just talked about loving, it's not self-seeking, it's not envy, it's not boastful, um, it's not concerned about wrongdoing, it, it controls the temper. These are all areas of the soul, and hope is directly connected to your emotional state. Love never fails. Prophecies will fail, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will, be, it will pass away. For we know in part, we prophesy in part, but when a completeness comes, that is, when it, appear, it, it disappears. When I was chi a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection in a mirror. Then we will see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall fully know even as I am fully known. And again, these three remain, faith, hope, and love. Now I want to encourage you that right now we, and that was a lot, um, we are, we're, we're looking at the situation and the crisis through a mirror that is, that is a, that's fogged up. We don't see what's going on in the spirit world. We don't see what's going on behind the veil. The prophets do, I guess. Uh, they say that it's going to end soon. I hope so. But as far as where we're at, we don't know what's going on. And that's a very scary place to be. Um, we see this as a reflection. And so I'm going to help you to put the whole thing into perspective, to give you some clarity about what is the Christian response in order to move forward. Now, uh, a couple weeks ago, when this first happened, uh, when we were meeting in church, but we were doing social distancing, um, I it was so hard when we first started, you know, practicing the social distancing because our natural uh, response to people is to shake the hand, is to hug, is to it's to engage, is to touch, is to smile. So that's that's just what we do, and that that's how God designed us. And now we are, and again, we should do this. We need to social distance. We need to make sure that we're not in each other's space, getting each other affected. But again, I want, I want to make you mindful. Because I remember I was trying to, you know, I was like, I'm trying to, I don't think I was touching elbows with somebody, and I just saw this person recoil. And I was like, oh, it's just, ah, I just don't like it. And see, and again, we need to, we need to learn it in this season. But when the season is over, I want to encourage you to apply some self-discipline to reach out and touch people once again. This too shall pass. You see, the, that recoil thing, that pulling back, is a, is a learned trait. We weren't made for uh, distancing ourselves from people. It's something that is learned. 
Uh, men are afraid of dogs because they were once bitten, right? It, it, I like dogs. I mean, I, I don't, I'm not afraid of dogs. I had a friend that was bit in the face once, and like he could not be around my dog, and you know my dog wouldn't bite him. I bit him somebody before, but my, my my dog would not bite him, but he just he could not get beyond that fear because his soul was shattered. But likewise, there's 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 women, there's ladies. Um, whenever a man maybe puts their hand on their shoulder, the gal's skin crawls and they recoil from the touch of a man. And, and why is that? that? That's because somewhere in their history they were hurt or they were abused or they were taken advantage of. And so they, they learned that response. And, and it needed to, and, and, and you know, it's probably a good thing to, to, to learn. But we weren't made to recoil from the touch of a human person. This is something that the enemy of God does. And so I actually, I thank God for the Me Too movement because that's going to change things. It is changing things. And so maybe there won't be that fear of touch. Um, maybe you've had this experience where you're, you're in the grocery store and you're buying the things that you need to support your family. And you're just you're you're scared to death just to even breathe the air that's around you. It's just like you, you, in, in your mind you've been trained that the air itself is contaminated, and that these people have cooties, or they could have cooties. Maybe maybe they do. Maybe they don't. I mean, again, we need to make sure that we're that we're taking care and we're taking all the precautions. We get the masks. We do absolutely everything to stem this up, this tide. That's what I'm saying. But again, once it's over, I want us to unlearn those traits that pull us back from how God has created us for, and He's created us for connection and not isolation. This is what we do know about the enemy of God. Darwin, Darwin likes disease because it thins the herd. The devil likes disunity because that's how he builds his kingdom. So Jesus doesn't like disunity. Jesus builds his kingdom with unity. Jesus, when he touches, when he touches a fractured soul, he touches in Hearts are healed. People don't recoil. This is how, how we need to live our lives. We need to live our lives like Jesus. So when we touch somebody, their hearts are healed. They don't pull back. And when Jesus breathes on people, they receive the power of the Holy Spirit. These are the things that I want you to think about. Build your faith. Don't lose sight of who Jesus is. Build your faith. Continue to live a lifestyle that emulates Him. Do everything that He does if you can. Inside of wisdom, inside of uh, discernment. Have a faith. That the prayer of faith will heal the sick. Have a faith that can move mountains. Have a faith that runs very deep and is not shallow. Have a hope. Have an emotional stance, emotional strength that will carry us through this difficult season. Have a hope, strong hope, that builds your character. Hope will build your character. Faith will build your spirit. Hope will build your character. Our character is being challenged right now and being built. Our faith is being challenged right now and being built. Lean into these things. Increase your faith by prayer, by fasting, by worship, and increase your hope 
right? Becoming a better person, developing your character, find some good books to read, take this as an opportunity to grow. Now next week again, I don't know where we're going to be. Um, we could be right back here, or we could be out in the parking lot. You just kind of need to stay connected, and I'll let you know. Um, I don't know what's going to happen, but you need to know this. I'm very clear about what our message is. Our message is one of faith, and one of hope, and one of connection, and one of serving. That will never change. We just have to be flexible and adapt to what is going on. Now, when this is all over, my hope for you is that you're going to be smarter, stronger, faster, a, the better version of yourself. This pressure, is, it's either going to make you or break you, but you've got to believe with everything deep down inside of you that it's going to make you. There is chatter that we're on the, the verge of the next great awakening or the next great revival. And I believe that. And I want you to be a part of it. So don't, don't waver in your faith. Don't give up hope in this season. God's going to do something absolutely amazing. But it's going to be according to our faith. Love you very much. Uh, see you guys online. Uh, uh, incidentally, we'll probably be doing a Bible study on Wednesday night. Again, we're just kind of making this up as we go. But um, we want to connect with you and... Uh, Hopefully we'll see you on Wednesday night. God bless you guys, and happy Sunday.